everyone. <laughs> I'm Monica Hinden from Final Pixel. Uh, I am so grateful to be here today. Uh, I'm going to do a seminar mostly on uh, the virtual art department and how it interacts with uh, virtual production. But I will be doing a bit of a virtual production 101 just to make sure we're all on the same page. Because uh, as per Todd before, the word gets the term gets thrown around a lot, uh, but we don't necessarily always know what we're talking about. Um, so I'm happy to be here, uh, and we're going to jump right in. So first, a bit about Final Pixel, who we are, uh, Global Creative Studio. Um, from We do end-to-end -end virtual production, meaning we really are involved in the process from start to finish. So we are not um, an equipment provider. We are not just a virtual art department. We um, understand the process from beginning to end, which is really helpful to our clients. Um, which, speaking of our clients, we really um, specialize in short form and advertising. That's kind of been our focus for the last two years. We come at this from a filmmaking point of view. So um, virtual production obviously has a lot of visual effects. I know that's who's here today. Uh, my background is in filmmaking and production as are uh, my partners. This is one of them, Chris. So we really come at it from production and filmmaking, and we've brought in visual effects into our um, purview over the last few years and built it out from that side, because really it is a combination of the two. You can't have one without the other in virtual production. Um, quickly, I'm gonna show you my reel, and then we'll get into the seminar. <clears throat> Dancing, it's written in the stars. Family to me are the people that show you unconditional love and support. Dancing with the Stars will blow you away. Today, we're going to cover what is virtual production, some benefits, then I'm going to get into org charts of our VAD and um, on-set virtual production teams and how uh, they interact in our productions, then talk about uh, VAD and pre-production, what, what myself as a producer, um, how I work with the VAD at the beginning of a project to ensure it's being built correctly, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about etiquette on set, and then time for Q&A if there's any. <clears throat> so, what is virtual production? Um, and I realize I, we may have covered this in a couple seminars today. Some of you I undoubtedly know about this. If you do, brush your eyes for seven minutes. I'll come back to you shortly. But for those of you that are a little unsure, what the heck are we all talking about? By definition, virtual production is where the physical and the digital worlds meet. So what we specialize in is often called ICVFX and camera VFX, which is basically taking a handful of um, technologies that have been in our industry for quite some time, using them in a new way. We combine them with uh, set decoration, practical foreground, and we create an illusion where ideally you can't tell where one ends and the other one begins. So this kind of production has been in our world for years. Um, we've, I've done a lot of work on LED screens. Usually we're putting up a still or a video plate. So what's the difference? The difference is the parallax effect, which as artists, I'm sure many of you understand. Uh, it, is what, it is what trains your brain or, or how your brain understands that you are in a real space. So in this example, you're on a train um, flying through the countryside. The trees are whipping past you. You can't see any sort of detail. It's just a green blur. The um, homes in the midground are, are moving at a, st at a steady pace, but you can see the colors they're painted and those sort of things. And then the mountains in the, in the far uh, distance are moving very slowly. It takes 30 minutes to pass one. So the different speed um, those things are moving in relation to you is what tells your eyes and therefore your brain you are in a real space. This is a real um, scene that you're looking at outside your window. If that all moved at the exact same pace, like a still image, you would immediately feel like there was a, 
a painting stuck outside that window, right? So that's what this, that's what virtual production gives you. Whereas in the past, you could put a still or a video on a screen and shoot in front of it and it would look real until that camera moves. And as soon as that camera moves, that parallax effect is not there and immediately your brain says that's not a real space. So with virtual production, we now have parallax. So there's quite a bit of technology involved. I'm gonna cover the key, like the main three. Um, video game engine, obviously, Unreal is what most of us use. Um, this is what enables us to create a real-time uh, environment, meaning uh, we create our environment in Unreal, we are able to shoot with it. Um, it renders in real time. So as the camera moves, you get that parallax, you get the shading, you get the shadows all move um, in real time on set within the environment. So no longer are we having to record camera data, data then go into post-production, feed that data into your um, environment, render it for hours, if not days, um, and change things. Or God forbid, your director shoots a bunch of crazy stuff that doesn't even fit what you created um, for your post-process and you have to redo everything. Uh, second is camera tracking. Again, a technology we've had for ages. Uh, this in a sense, you know, we're really just um, recording the data of the camera and feeding it into Unreal. So on the day of, while you're shooting, that camera is moving within that environment in Unreal. Um, and for the record, just to, to acknowledge, this is a very base level um, overview, understanding. I do this seminar um, for a lot of um, advertising folks that don't know anything about production, so this is very base level. Um, Again, if you want to go deep, there's a lot more to it, but this is just kind of the, the, um, the distant view of it. Anyways, camera tracking. And then third is you need your LED wall or your volume, which can be set up in a myriad of ways depending on your creative needs. So you combine those together and you have what we call virtual production ICVFX. And this, you can see this camera has been tracked that is an unreal environment that is doing real-time rendering on an LED volume. You can see those pillars are moving in relation to the camera. That's your parallax. The, the, they're moving in different speeds depending on where they are. <clears throat> that rectangle you're seeing is called a frustum. That's what the camera is actually seeing, what's in the lens. It takes a ton of processing power to create this illusion, and so we only process what is in camera. To do the whole volume would be a waste of power that we want to be putting into that centralized space so we can put as much power into that as possible, make it look as good as possible. Here's a production still of, of a shoot we did where it's a good example of the LED volume in the background and practical foreground elements. And that's the key. That's really, you know, I've, I say three technologies. The fourth most important, uh, not most, but the fourth just as important is practical elements to create that illusion. Just putting someone in front of a volume can look really cool, but it doesn't last very long. You really need that practical um, connection to create that illusion. So some benefits that we found um, over the years the most obvious unavailable locations. I think the Mandalorian was a great example of that. Um, but what we were seeing when we started off was a lot of things like the surface of Mars or you know, you know places that don't exist, which is very cool and a great use of it. Um, for our um, commercial uses, my um, advertising clients, they don't generally want to shoot on Mars. They want to shoot um, in living rooms uh, and kitchens, or they want to shoot in New York City um, in January and they can't because it's cold or so anyways we are this not only does it give you locations that you know are physically impossible like tattooing but also places that either your budget or um, weather what have you would would not allow you to get there otherwise we have a lot of retail clients that are dying for us to create their spaces so that they can't they can shoot in them and not have to worry about shutting down their stores, um, losing that run of revenue, or shutting it down and, and shooting you know, from 2 to 5 in the morning, which is horrible, trust me. Um, <clears throat> you can, we can shoot multiple locations in one day. So this is an example of a project we did where we had four completely unrelated locations, four celebrities we shot in one day, um, which before virtual production would have been impossible. We would have need, needed multiple days. We would have had company moves and it wouldn't have happened because getting four celebrities for multiple days is generally unlikely for a commercial campaign. So um, it really broadens um, creative possibilities for that. 
car plates. This says car plates, but it's really about reflective surfaces that I'm sure many artists here um, are aware of the pain it is to either remove reflections, add in reflections, clean up green spill, all of that is gone because you get realistic reflections of your environment on the LED volume onto the surface, whatever that is, a car or anything else. Um, also embargoed products. So we have a lot of clients that have a product that exists in this country, but they want the creative at the sea and they can't combine them because they can't move the, the um, excuse me, the product. So now we can combine the product in whatever environment location they want. We can bring the location to the product. We achieve final pixel on set, um, which is again, just, um, I keep this in for a lot of our clients that still don't understand what the heck this is. Uh, there's no compositing to do at the end of the day, right? There's no green screen, there's nothing to do. You walk away, in essence, with, um, with location footage. As a producer, I love this one, though I hope to lose it someday. Um, it's a lot easier to manage uh, COVID safety in a studio rather than traveling people all over the world or even a city. <clears throat> and sustainability, I have a whole other seminar I can do on this. I will not do it this today, um, but Without even trying to, virtual production is much more green. Um, we're working right now with a couple of institutions to get some real um, data on that so we don't just say, oh yeah, it's green, because it is, obviously, but we really want to prove that so that then we can make it better. But um, based on a study by Albert in, um, in the UK, the number one carbon um, producer of advertising is um, travel. So this immediately cuts that down by not requiring travel to other locations. Um, also, as mentioned before, it minimizes needs for company moves. And a company move, if any of you have done that, can be you know a crew of 100 people, um, massive generators, massive um, motor homes for talent, bathrooms, just huge caravans moving around a city that's already crowded and filthy. So really bringing all that down is fantastic. And then again, you're in a studio, so ideally you're working with studios that are being powered by renewable energy. So. That's my plug on sustainability. We can talk more about that another time. And no more green screen. Now, I will say, there is still a place for green screen. There is still a place for traditional location shooting. Virtual production does not take away all of that by any means. But it certainly gets rid of a lot of the unnecessary green screen that we've all been dealing with for years and years, um, and which directors and actors love. Also, don't be scared in post-production because it's not taking away that work, it's just moving it to earlier in the process. So the work is still there. Um, it just takes away the annoyance of the green. So this is my org chart that I've created. It is not perfect, it is going to change. I think the thing we all know about this right now is that we're all learning and, and changing as we go. So this is kind of how we are currently um, in Final Pixel with our virtual art department here on the left and on the right, our onset virtual production department. That's what we call it, our OSVP. So we start, the head of everyone is our director of virtual production. Um, and that role within Final Pixel is held by um, my business partner, Michael McKenna, who's based in London. Um, and then under him, our VFX supervisor and B VP supervisor. So the left side, the VAD, VFX supervisor, we also call it VAD supervisor. I tend to stick with VFX because people don't have experience as a VAD supervisor, and so suddenly it's a role that they don't know and they, it doesn't exist and they're scared of it. So VFX supervisor, I hope in a couple of years to be able to call it VAD soup. But really they manage the team of any mixture of those six plus, depending on what the creative is. So our lighting artists, concept artists every time, our environment artists, those are the guys that are working in Unreal, our modelers, which I'm sure many of you are very aware of, <clears throat> creature, groom artists, animators, depends on what the creative is, um, which of those roles we're filling, how many people are in each role, um, and I'm sure there's, there's more to add to that. On the other side, under our VP supervisor, so we have our disguise, we have disguise in here, which is generally what we use, but our control software operator, whoever that is, and then the lead engineer who kind of manages the team of the, um, the main you know, techs, the, that's the team that are really ensuring that the equipment on set is working correctly. Because the number one thing on a commercial shoot is there is no downtime. Um, that's my experience, in, I, my experience is in commercials, so I can't speak to TV and film. Obviously, no one wants downtime, it's expensive. But a commercial shoot, you know, you could be burning $10,000, $50,000 an, 
you know, a minute. So you have to have everything working perfectly. There can no, be no, oh, this thing's not working. Give me 10 minutes to work it out. You don't have time for that. So that team is very, um, needs to be really tight and on top of, of their equipment that it's working perfectly. And then in the middle is this special area that's kind of between the two. So head by our senior technical artist. Um, and I have on set because really our virtual art department, our VAD is remote. Um, and that's the way we work. We were built, we built up during the lockdown. So naturally we built ourselves as a remote company, but really they're, they're not on set. They don't need to be on set. They're all pre-production working together. What we always require is at least one of our environment artists come to set as the senior technical artist to kind of be that lead on the environments, um, someone that's been in the process the whole time. So they're the one at the box um, managing the Unreal um, system. And to point out, of the, the on-set team, um, the VP supervisor is also involved through pre-production with our VAD team, because they need to be aware of the technical specs on set, what, um, you know, making sure that the VAD has the correct specs, they're building to the correct specs, ideally they're they have access, ideally the VP supervisor has access to the volume to do some early tests with the environments. Um, so they're involved as well. But that senior technical artist in the middle, they start on VAD and then they kind of move over to the onset team because really what we want is that um, those days while we're prepping to get and we're on set, we're prepping for the shoot, we want to really hand that project off to the onset team. Um, and we can't. We we can, and we do have our VAD remote and available. But we want that onset team to feel um, in control of the project. And so, having that onset technical artist from the VAD team is very important. And then, depending on the size of the project, they may have a team under them supporting them. Um, so, anyways, and we'll get back to this uh, later in the session. I find a lot of people really like this org chart, so I'm going to bring it back in a minute. <clears throat> but moving on. So VAD and pre-production, um, before you start a build, there's a lot of things you need to talk out with the different teams um, to determine what it is you're actually building. Um, and that's very important because right now a lot of people get into virtual production and don't know what it is or what they need, and they just want to start building something. But what is it we're working with? <clears throat> so I'm, I have slides for each one of these. Camera tracking, is it pre or final pixel? Practical set is a big one, baked lighting versus real time, and the tech connecting the two teams. <clears throat> so camera tracking, number one, is this really going to involve camera tracking? Is the camera going to be moving? Do we want that integration between the environment and the camera? This is something that I've learned, I have to say, right from the beginning. In my opinion, if we're talking about virtual production, of course, of course there's camera tracking. But not always, they don't necessarily always want it. So that's a key thing. Are we working with camera tracking? Because if we're not, we don't even necessarily need to build something on Unreal. Uh, oh, here's our video, you saw that earlier. <clears throat> Next, is this going to be used for previs, um, as Marianne was showing us earlier? Or is it for final pixel? Are we trying to shoot this in camera um, for, for final, to go into to final post? So the difference, and again, all kind of top level, um, but pr so the previs is generally used for rough 3D and visualization to help your creative um, plan the, the sets and camera moves and all that. Um, often it's paired with green screen shooting, as mentioned before, um, Favreau and um, The Lion King, no, excuse me, and The Jungle Book are a really good example of that. Um, there's some really cool videos online of you see them shooting with the blue screen, um, but in the monitor, they can see their previs environment um, and how it all works together. And it's much cleaner and more integrated than traditional kind of back, back plate rough compositing on set. So previs would be used for that. But ultimately, um, a VFX house still gets involved and um, complete does the final finishing. <clears throat> final pixel, if you're building an environment that needs to run on set on the volume, ready for, for final shooting, you need to know that going into it. Um, so that has to be optimized for real time. It needs to run correctly on the volume. Um, basically what you see is what you get with this. So you need to make sure what you're building is going to work on the, on the volume and be um, up to snuff. 
practical set discussion. This is a really big one. Um, ideally, uh, you have access to the production designer early on in the process. That's a key thing we tell everyone that are getting into virtual production, that that person needs to be brought in earlier when your VAD is creating the environment. Uh, when you look at the boards, you need to look what is going to be virtual in our environment and what's going to be practical, what's the art department sourcing. And that conversation needs to be had. So. Um, sometimes it's really obvious if the actor is sitting on a couch, well, that has to be practical. We know that. Um, but so talk through that. Where is that, that delineation? And it doesn't have to be exactly defined at the very beginning, but everyone should have an idea. And then as you get deeper, you can really define it. The seam. The seam is the bane of, of all of our existence. Um, the seam between the wall and the floor. Hiding that is key. Um, if you don't hide that, effectively the whole illusion is shot. So a lot of times you'll see um, set pieces. That's what we have in this image here. A set piece is, is hiding the ball or the seam, excuse me. Um, it really depends. You also get into blocking how that adjust affects it. Lighting can really affect it. Um, what floor you choose. Um, so those conversations need to be had very early on um, because just throwing that in at the last minute, it's not going to look correct. Um, and then thinking through what materials and textures in the practical set are, are going to affect your build. So again, is there a floor in the practical set that's going to lead into your, um, your virtual set? Then we need to talk through what that is and make sure we're going to get scans of that. Um, props and things. Are there specific props that are practical that you're going to need to re recreate in the virtual set? So things like that you need to have that conversation early on. Um, I'm going to show you this spot. Um, it was a great example. Our director didn't want to deal with the floor and the seam. Um, he didn't want to slow it down. We had one day. Um, and so he composed all of his shots. Um, so basically cowboying up aside from this one, you'll see. I'll stop talking. You can just watch it. <laughs> Step into a world of endless possibilities. All the elements you need for your next big breakthrough are all on one platform. Whether you're building websites or designing social ads, turning your ideas into achievements has never been easier. What can you create with 100% Shutterstock? What I think is so funny and so much of the work we do right now is the client always wants to pull out and reveal the volume. <laughs> like, look, look, look what we did, um, which is great and that's fun, but I, I look forward to the day where people are willing to just use this as a production technique and we don't need to rely on, you know, showing the trick to make it cool because it is cool. And real fast, I just, this was, this is not scripted, but I have to tell you. Um, I, truly believe in virtual production. You know, I've been through 360 video and 3D TV and all that and having to produce things for that stuff and just rolling my eyes the whole time. Sorry if that offends anyone. But this makes sense to me. This I believe in because to the user, it doesn't change anything. It's not a new fad. It's not a new technique. They're still getting their stories and their content and it doesn't change anything for them. Um, what it changes is for us, it, it opens up so many doors, enables us to do other things back to the benefits slides, but just my two cents. Um, so back to our list of things um, that we need to cover before really starting the build. Baked lighting versus dynamic lighting. How much are you going to have of each in your environment? It really depends on how much um, they need access to the lighting um, in the scene um, on, the sh on the shoot day. How much are they going to want to be adjusting the lighting? Uh, Baked lighting makes your environment more realistic. So you want to bake as much as you possibly can. It lowers the file size of the project, which makes it run smoother on the volume, um, and it makes it look more photoreal. But once they're baked, you can't change lights. You can, but you have to go back to Unreal. It's a whole process, and you don't want to stop down the day to do that. You can, but it's, it's, I, it's better not to. Dynamic lighting is what are the lights that you're leaving to be able to adjust on the shoot day. And we're not talking about the pre-light, we're talking about on the shoot day. So obviously any lights that 
are a part of the action, a light that you want to turn on when someone walks into a room, obviously that kind of stuff. Um, you basically, what it is, is just allowing disguise to um, see those layers and those those specific lights and adjust them. Um, but if you don't, if you have them baked, disguise can't see them, can't address them. So it's just something to keep in mind, it needs to be a conversation um, with the key players and it, it needs to happen before the shoot day because again, that can really slow down your day. So you've had all these conversations and now you're gonna say, okay, what are we actually going to build? So these are you know, six types of environments that we build depending on, on, um, on you know, the answers to all those questions. Also, something that I didn't get into because this isn't a talk for producers, but obviously budget and schedule make a big difference in these two. Um, so the more time and money you have, the more custom you can be, the more crazy you can get. Sometimes if you have less, you need to choose something that's a little simpler. <clears throat> so first, so you're doing an original build. So this is building it um, from scratch, maybe taking some pieces um, from you know, Marketplace or Turbo Squad or what have you, but creating your environment from scratch in Unreal for that real time um, environment with camera tracking and, and all the bells and whistles. This, I love. I love them all. Um, next, marketplace asset. I cringe when I hear clients say, well, let's just get a, let's just get a marketplace asset. Yes, you can. And there are beautiful ones. And they are cheap. They are not guaranteed to run in real time on your gigantic volume. And so it really worries me when I say someone say, when I hear someone say, we'll just grab a marketplace asset. Don't assume it will work. And what you end up a lot of times doing when you get the marketplace asset is spending just as much time and money fixing it for, for real time than you would have maybe just building it from scratch and getting exactly what you wanted. This is an example of one that we grabbed that worked out well. We didn't have to do a ton to it. This is the original asset, and then we shot with this. This was our optimized asset. You can see we adjusted the lighting. We changed the chairs uh, because those were the chairs we were able to get for the practical for, um, set pieces, so we adjusted them in 3D. Uh, so that, that's a great option, obviously, if you don't have a lot of time and money, um, but you still want camera tracking. <clears throat> So this is, um, often we get calls to shoot in a location that already exists, um, and they might have CAD or FBX files, um, and that's really helpful. They can give us, this is, uh, we did Dancing with the Stars. They sent us um, their files from the show so that we cre could create this. Because of the pandemic, they couldn't shoot their marketing campaign on the show, or on the um, stage, excuse me. So um, here's Tyra on the stage. Dancing, it's written in the stars. Tune in to Good Morning America Wednesday when all will be revealed. And then the season premiere September 20th on ABC. And this is a good example of a, multiple benefits. A, they couldn't get to the location. Um, they didn't have access to it. Now they have it so they can shoot on it anytime they want. They don't have to coordinate with the show, which is really helpful. And B, this was part of a larger campaign where the creative was Tyra was a mirror ball. And so shooting her on green for this would have been really annoying. <laughs> um, next, backplates. So this is like old school. That's why I got Carrie in here. This is old school technology we're still using, right? I mean, this is a screen with a video of a plane flying over his head. This is a great example of something we can do if we don't have a lot of time or money. Camera's not moving. You don't need camera tracking. It worked for Hitchcock. It works for us still. So this is a great option. But I try to avoid it when we can because we're here now. So let's do something a little cooler. But still an option, especially if you have to shoot a d bunch of scenes at one, in one day or in a shorter period of time. You can pick one or two that maybe this would work for. Same for a still. <clears throat> Photogrammetry and LiDAR. So we get asked about this a lot. <clears throat> to be honest, we don't use it a lot. Um, we've found for our needs, specifically in commercial production, um, it generally is better for us just to build something uh, from scratch. We rarely have to completely match something um, perfectly. And uh, this can be really time and processing heavy, which often we don't have in commercials. Uh, but as I mentioned, we do use um, this technology a lot of the time for smaller pieces or something that maybe we want to recreate in the scene. I have, um, how are we doing on time? I have, okay, we're okay. I have like a three minute video that I think is really useful. Um, a really simple um, explanation of this. If you could, I'm gonna play it. <laughs> we did not make this. I can't take credit for this.
like that video. I think it, it kind of explains that process pretty smoothly. Again, I think that's really simp really obvious um, to see it's it, the benefit of that in gaming or um, in film where there's um, large swaths of an environment that you want to recreate. Again, for commercials, our, our shots are so specific and so planned out that we generally don't need to go to that level of detail. Um, and then matte painting, again, this is an old school technique that's still used uh, today, similar to the to the cards, um, the Cary Grant example. This is um, a good uh, visual. Again, I, we didn't, create, I found this from the internet. I don't think it's a great picture, it's not mine. Um, but this is a great example of using um, two, two and a half D in virtual production. So you can create um, your painting, have a couple of layers separated out, and that can allow the camera to move a bit and get a bit of parallax. So you can have a little bit of that um, without an, you know, being able to deliver on those fully dynamic moves in an unreal environment, but can push it a little further than just a static image. <clears throat> So back to this, our virtual art department, our on-set virtual production team. Also, to, to point out um, the term brain bar was used for a long time. Now we're using hearing the term volume control of this team. Um, all of that works. We call it OSVP and have just stuck to it because that works. I don't like brain bar to start with. But either way, to me, that is the, the brain bar or the control um, the volume control team, they are still within this department from my point of view. The VP supervisor is that head of department and whoever you wanna call those folks at that table, um, they're within this department that I consider onset virtual production. So into that center section. So what I find really interesting as a producer in commercials is, you know, we, there's a very specific way of um, handling yourself on set. And there's a, you know, there's a whole, dictionary of terms on set. There's all sorts of expectations and people um, learn um, from the bottom up. They start as production assistants or camera assistants. They're junior in a department, that team brings them up. Suddenly we have um, an onset virtual production team that have never been on set and there is no junior people and they're all of a sudden all on set. Not to say they're not professionals, they're coming from live events, they're coming from video gaming, they're coming from all sorts of things, but they haven't been on necessarily a commercial set or film or TV set, whatever it is. So um, I, I, it's an interesting situation. We're finding that there's people with very important roles that are on set for the very first time. So that's, that's a scary thing to be if you're ever caught in that situation. So um, I cover a few things um, that we call set uh, If it's your first time on set or if you know someone that's stuck in this position, uh, I had a technical artist go, it was two years ago and like, I mean, this gal had literally never left um, the state of Ohio and we flew her to LA and made her find her way to set. And she was like running the Unreal Box and was like, what the hell am I doing? She was so green, but she nailed it. But it's important to help people understand some of the key things. So if you find yourself in this situation, make sure you know who your head of department is, which should be the VP supervisor. If it's not, find out who that is. Either way, know who the head of your department is because they're kind of, they're your boss, but they're also your champion to make sure that everything's working correctly. Make sure you know your call time. That's that's when you're supposed to be ready to work, um, which means you should get there a little early. Not too early. Whoops, 10, 15 minutes is fine. But you also need to confirm receipt of your telephone. That's a crazy thing in production. You got to make sure everyone knows. I know, I heard, I will be there. Um, and then make sure you know how you're getting paid. Ideally, your head of department will know. You can cover that with them. Um, are you getting paid hourly? Is there overtime? At what point do you hit overtime? Are you being paid by time card or invoice? All of those things are good to find out. And if they are not sure or unclear, you talk to production. They will be the ones that are facilitating your payment. So production can get crazy and fast and busy. And so um, sometimes you're not sure. And especially about payment, it makes people jumpy. So just know who to talk to and speak to them. Make sure you get it covered so you know exactly the process. Um, it's good to know who the client director and creatives are. Um, when there is that volume control team on the, on the desk and it's a high pressure point and something's not working, people tend to run over and look at the monitor and tell people what to do. And if you don't know who's who, you don't know who to listen to, and that can create really big problems. Um, so the key is know who the client is and be respectful to them, but don't do anything they say. 
because <laughs> that's them jumping things that they shouldn't be jumping. So smile and say, I heard you, and then go find your head of department. Same with the director, DP, the creatives, all of those. Obviously, your team, the director and DP are key. But even the director and DP, if they tell you, change this light, move this thing, your VP supervisor has to be involved in this. You, we can't just have a, a random, um, not random, you're very important. We can't have an artist on set controlling the scene that everyone there has been a part of all of a sudden moving things because one person's freaking out, wants to change it, um, and they don't necessarily know the cascade effect of that. So just make sure you know who those people are, be very respectful to them, but always make sure your VP supervisor is aware of any changes you might do um, on set in real time. Find out who the AD is, that's the assistant director. Basically, they're kind of the conductor of the day. They're in charge of making sure the day runs on time. The teams know what they're doing. Everyone knows what's coming up next. They're running the show. So make sure you know who they are and listen to them. Um, you can't ever leave your post um, during rehearsal or filming. Uh, it's not a desk job. You can't come and go once you've done your job. Even though there doesn't seem anything to do, you can't leave, obviously, if you have to check with your head of department, whoever it is, find out, you know, make sure there's coverage because the worst thing to happen is Tyra Banks comes out of her dressing room. All of a sudden you've been waiting two hours. Now she shows up and it needs to work and the desk is empty. So you just need to never leave your post unless you've, you've confirmed with someone and have coverage and obvious silent cell phones. We all forget sometimes I've messed up a few shots, but don't silence your cell phone. Don't take calls once that again, even if it doesn't seem like there's anything going on, because the second you take that call, something will happen. So just save that for lunch. Um, and uh, final note, I'm just going to show you our virtual art department reel um, so you can see some of the environments that we've done. And then we'll have time for questions. Thank you for watching. Any that questions? Was, that was awesome. Yeah. Are there uh, any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Awesome. Uh, it, and so I'm going to pass the mic because there's not an easy way to get through there. Let me see here. Maybe I can get through here. Sir, can I sneak through here real quick? OK, here we go. Uh, I was just wondering, you mentioned that sometimes certain assets aren't um, like optimized to be able to be used on the volume. Does that just have to do with like poly count or resolution or anything? Exactly. Like okay, Most okay. and and not being an artist myself, I'm sure there's more to it. But I know the number one thing is poly count. There's insane excesses, so we have to bring it down so much we end up rebuilding a lot of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've got one over here too. Uh, I appreciate the consideration for the carbon footprint. Um, actually, I know that Film Academy was presenting some findings recently, so I'm curious to see uh, what the, the next set of studies will reveal. Um, but as far as training your staff to make this jump over to a new way of working, what were some of the kind of pitfalls of converting like a traditional pipeline and talent to now work in the real time space? Well, I will say, as I mentioned in here, one of the biggest pitfalls is putting people on set. And, and again, as I, as I started this, my experience is from production um, and, and filmmaking. So that's what I have seen the transition in and, and my problems of like, oh, people don't know what, what it's like to be on set or how to handle that. I myself am learning the visual effects pipeline through virtual production. So from my personal experience, I'm, I'm learning it all at once, which is a little overwhelming. Um, but um, I think we found uh, from my VFX 
supervisor who I rely on quite a bit. Um, the poor man answers a lot of questions for me all the time. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things we love is working with students because they're not coming in with an assumption um, of this is how we do it. I will say I have a hard time um, finding producers because they have a really hard time adjusting their workflow and the way they um, manage clients and the, the process. Um, the artists on the whole gen generally tend to be relatively um, flexible with, with adjusting our to our pipeline and, and we, we work through it as we go. I will say we have a ton of meetings and I'm really hoping we can change that eventually, but we are constantly having to check in with each other, A, because we're remote, but B, you know, so much can fall through the cracks or something can be forgotten because this isn't a pipeline everyone's used to. So we're having to do a lot of check-ins that I hope eventually we don't have to meet as often. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. Yeah. Uh, so what generally is your like um, your ramp up time? Because you said a lot of the uh, pre-production sort of is, or the post-production is front loaded for this. Like, can you kind of give like a ballpark for? Yeah. yeah. So we, because that's the number one question I get from a potential agency clients. Um, we say six weeks. My gut clenches every time I say that because I'd like eight weeks or more. The clients laugh at me when I say six weeks because they'll never give us that. So um, six weeks seems to be kind of the sweet spot that I start the negotiating from. <laughs> um, and then it depends, again, on what are we creating? Are we creating four environments? Are we creating one? Are they 360 environments? Is it one, one sliver? Again, is there um, camera tracking? Do they just want plates? Is two and a half D going to work for it? So there's a lot of that negotiating with how much time they have. A lot of times, honestly, the time is what determines what kind of environment we're creating more than anything because you, and, and that was an early learning we had where we, every project we'd wanna create these brand new amazing environments and we were killing ourselves and actually kind of, um, I think, under delivering sometimes on the creative when we could have simplified something and maybe in that scene just done a two and a half D plate because there wasn't a ton of camera movement or something like that. <clears throat> Anything else? Yeah. I'm on my way. <laughs> oh, right. How often do you have to address client changes after the fact? So you've done your in-camera VFX work. Now they still don't like it, and mm -hmm. they want a traditional VFX <laughs> solution. How do you go about that? Well, I am really insane about educating them early on in the process um, to the point where it probably hurts us. We'd probably get more work if I wasn't so insane because I think it scares them away a lot how strict, not strict, but how clear I am that we need to all be on the same page early on. Um, and that is something we've learned. And one of the reasons we really are insane about being involved in the entire production um, because whoever is interacting with that client, the agency, whoever needs to understand what is and what isn't possible, so they're communicating to them because they don't know. They need to be educated. And so if you're not being clear to them, you're not managing their expectations, of course later they're going to want to change it and they're going to be really pissed when you can't because that's what they need to do. So we're constantly in every review making sure they understand what we've done, what, we's, what we're planning to do. Um, anytime I see a pause or a, an eyebrow raise, we're stopping. What are you thinking? Look, get Pull that out of them because you cannot wait till post. Um, you can, but it's gonna cost everyone a lot of time and money and they don't have that. And they respect that when I, you know, for the 400th time I say it, like I'm just trying to save you time and money. So on the whole, we don't get a lot of changes to be perfectly honest. Um, and. I don't know if that's going to change. At this point, a lot of times they're, um, at that point, you've created such a bond and they're so reliant on you to learn what's going on that if you say, no, you can't, or that's going to be this much time and money, they'll generally back off. We've never had a situation where they like want to change everything. And that's the beauty. They are now seeing more through the whole process than they ever did. So what was so common before is we'd get on set and they'd be like, what is this? I hate that rug. Or that's not the kind of tree I thought would be here. Or now, because they were looking at, you know, mood boards and image pulls and 
all that, but it wasn't the actual scene. And now they've seen the scene and they walk on set and it's exactly what they've seen the whole time. And so there are no surprises. I think a key, I could talk about this for 45 minutes, so I'll stop soon. But I think the key is also, and this is hard with some clients, making clear who are the decision makers and getting them into the meetings. You can't wait until the week before for them to show the final decision maker. Um, and that can, I think, after a few projects, you can open it up to that. But especially the first one, you need to know who those key decision makers are and have them every review meeting and get their concerns and questions and make get everyone on the same page that whole time. And I truly believe it's the producer's job to ensure that's happening so that you don't get in trouble in post. Yeah. We, we have time if there's more questions. Okay, Fabulous. well, let's, uh, let's definitely give Monica another big round of applause. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank that you. was wonderful. <laughs>